welcome while you are at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family. And we certainly would love to wish you all a blessed Advent. We would love to hear from you. So today we're taking comments and questions from you, our viewers. If you're watching, it's a live broadcast. It's Monday. Please give us a jingle at 1-800-221-9460. If you are calling and you are outside North America, please reach us at area code 205-271-2980. You can always send us an email with a question or a comment to Jim and Joy at EWTN.com and check us out on Facebook. Well, we had a very busy weekend and it was weekend. Thanksgiving and what we were, it was full. I hope and pray that you all had a wonderful um, weekend with your family and traveling or maybe staying still but eating. Yeah and celebrating and we had grandchildren over we had our children over we had wound up having 23 yeah. for dinner which was fun could have been a lot more it could we have, have heard of more. people have like 35 40 people over yeah. their homes yeah. yeah so we set the table everyone was there um, the only family that wasn't there was our daughter Anna and her four children because they were rotating with the other in-laws. And so those are some of our granddaughters who we love. We had the annual football game, Absolutely. which is fun. And um, some of the older men played, which they were regretful afterwards. Yeah. And it was kind of like, I need yeah. me some Tylenol. Yeah. And the littles played around with some bubbles as they could. It was pretty in Alabama. And so you were able to get outside and, and it was a lovely, lovely day. It was a beautiful family. Family day, but before we ate the beautiful meal, the 23-pound turkey and the ham and all the different fixings that go with that, we spoke about the true meaning of Thanksgiving. You always do. Oh, I always do. And so, yeah, and just, just that it's all about God, giving thanksgiving to God for every good thing, the many blessings that we experience, and, and to remind, remind ourselves of what a beautiful holiday it is, all the way back to the Puritans and giving thanks. And so we always keep the focus that ultimately Thanksgiving's not a family day, it's a God day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we thank God for our families and, and for our country, for our form of government, for the renewal that we pray will take place within our government and within the church. Mm -hmm. And so that's what the focus was and always should be. And so now we're in Advent. Now and, we're in Advent. A, a, a it was kind of like Thursday happened, Friday happened, and then over the weekend, it's the first Sunday in Advent. And that's the time where we prepare, yeah. where we wait with hopeful expectation yeah. as we celebrate our Lord's yeah. birthday. It's, it's a new year. It's a liturgical new year. It's a new year. year, so happy new year I to like you new all. beginnings. Yes. And uh, the, uh, the, the lesson for Sunday, the gospel reading said, Beware that your hearts do not become drowsy from carousing and drunkenness and the anxieties of daily life. Don't become drowsy. Yes. So it says, be vigilant at all times and pray that you have the strength to escape the tribulations that are imminent and to stand before the Son of Man. And so the call to us is Advent season. It's so cool. We have Advent before Christmas and we'll be doing shows Wednesday and Thursday on a book called Man Your Post. Um, and uh, so be vigilant, man your post, be a watchman for the ones you love, mm -hmm. your, your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, your, your community, this nation. Be a watchman on the wall, be vigilant because our enemy is like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, America. Resist him, nations of the earth. Resist him, church. Be firm and be vigilant in your faith. And that's our question for the day today is we wanted to share about welcoming the preborn into life by protecting them under the law because we have the Dobbs case coming up before the Supreme Court yes. on Wednesday, mm -hmm. which could overturn Roe versus Wade, which allowed abortion through all nine months. 62 million abortions approximately in the United States of America alone. God have mercy, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, and help us to establish laws that will protect every human life from the moment of conception through natural death. Give us a call, 1-800-221-9460. We want to hear your thoughts on protecting the preborn by law and bringing them into life. We'll be right back. Plenty more to come. Please don't go away.
Welcome back. Well, remember that today we're taking your comments and questions on our show. If you're watching, it's Monday and we are live. Please give us a jingle at 1-800-221-9460. Outside North America, you can reach us at area code 205-271-2980. And you can always send us an email with a question or a comment to Jim and Joy at EWTN. Dot com and check us out on Facebook. So we really want to welcome today, where the question, the theme for today's show is welcoming the preborn into life by protecting them under the law. Yeah. Now, we do know that in 1973, Roe versus Wade went to infect in our land. What some of you might not know is that it was unlimited abortion. And people go, oh no, well, there were restrictions. There was there was protection only in the death, the life and death of the mother or severe abnormalities. That's what a lot of us think. Sometimes even Catholics and Protestants as we're, we just don't understand really what happened when that law went into effect yeah. in our land. Well, we know, it, like you said, Joy, it led to abortion on demand, Roe versus Wade in the companion decision, Doe versus Bolton. Um, for the first 24 weeks, it was thought that you can have an abortion for any reason. It just goes ahead. It struck down all the laws in all the 50 states. And then in that last trimester, seven, eight, nine months, mm -hmm. uh, it said there could be restrictions. But those restrictions could be taken off of various reasons like economic concerns, psychological concerns, right. financial concerns. So really, any reason, if a state unlimited. allows it, mm. you can abort through all nine months. Mm. And so we have approximately 62 million preborn children who've been aborted. And moms and dads affected, other you know, siblings affected. And, and we say all this not to condemn, because this is a national sin. Um, and we know that some of the most eloquent spokespersons on behalf of life have been people who have experienced abortion. And so there's hope, there's help, there's healing. You'll see optionline.org will be put out throughout the show today. If you're hearing us and you're considering an abortion, reach optionline.org. If you've had an abortion, you need post-abortion healing, go to optionline.org and you can just put in your zip code and you'll find the help that you need. And so right now we have our dear friend, Professor Michael New. He's a research associate at the Catholic University of America the Bush School of Business, and Michael is uh, an expert and is in great demand regarding state-by-state -state laws and how they protect uh, human life. So, Michael, are you there? Yep. Jim, Joy, thanks for having me. It's great to have you. Of course, you're very aware, we want our people to be aware that on Wednesday, the Supreme Court will be hearing a very important case, uh, the Dobbs case. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that case, what's going to be happening on Wednesday, why is this case so significant? Sure. Uh, Wednesday morning, Supreme Court's going to hear a case called Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. This is a case that's going to look at the constitutionality of a law that protects preborn children after 15 weeks gestation. Uh, this is a law that was passed in Mississippi, signed by the governor. Uh, like most pro-life laws, it was challenged, and it's worked its way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, this is a very important case. It might be the most important abortion case the Supreme Court has looked at since the Roe v. Wade decision. I mean, the Supreme Court has, the court has looked at different kinds of abortion policies in the past. They've looked at taxpayer funding law, you know, provisions. They've looked at parental involvement laws. They've looked at different kinds of abortion clinic regulations. They've looked at the constitutionality of different kinds of abortion procedures. But they have yet to look at a very fundamental question. Can we protect preborn children after a certain point in gestation? And that is the exact issue this case looks at. So it's a very important case. Um, there's a good chance that the Mississippi law will be upheld. There's also a chance that the Roe v. Wade decision might be overturned, and that might restore preborn children to th pre protection uh, to thousands, if not millions, of preborn children. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what, what does this case do? You know, there's kind of a framework with Roe v. Wade of a trimester kind of way of thinking, and that, you know, when that was decided in 73, I'm not sure Roe versus Wade even said, I, I don't think it said, we don't know when human life begins. And so they, they were given this, this thing of, of these trimesters, and maybe at 24 weeks, that might be a viability area, then you can place restrictions. What does the Dobbs case do if it, if it passes muster and if it's upheld to that gestational 
age, that, that trimester system. Is that the key to this? That um, you know, at 15 weeks, well, is that viability or not? And if we can restrict at that point, then can we restrict before that point? What's going on with the gestational issue here, the trimester system? Well, it's interesting. The Supreme Court's never really looked at uh, you know, a case quite like this before. And I mean, there's a couple of different ways, a few different ways it could go. I mean, there's no guarantee they're going to really reconsider Roe v. Wade as such. They may vote to simply uphold the Mississippi law that protects pre-born children after 15 weeks gestation. Uh, when the Supreme Court issues a ruling, uh, that precedent is binding. So that means that other states could do the same thing, and they could also pass laws that protect children after uh, 15 weeks gestation. So obviously we want to protect all pre-born children. Uh, that's the goal of the pro-life movement. But that would still be an incremental win. And I think it you know, raises some important questions that we could use later on, that if we can protect a pre-born child for, at 15 weeks, why not 14 weeks? Why not 12 weeks? So I think that you know, an incremental win you know, would sow the seeds for uh, future victories down the road. So again, they could just look at the Mississippi law. They could, again, conceivably overturn Roe v. Wade. I mean, I think right now you have six judges on the Supreme Court that I would say are abortion skeptical. Uh, again, I don't like to make predictions, but that is a, you know, a very strong possibility. So as pro-lifers, you know, we need to be prepared. Well, Michael, is the Texas law having any bearing on this? Just because, you know, the Texas ruling, what they have ruled, they're saving over 100 babies a day just in the state of Texas, and that's the heartbeat law, right? Correct. Well, the Texas law is a little bit different than the Mississippi law. I mean, um, the Texas law... Um, you know, it's a heartbeat bill. It protects unborn children after a fetal heartbeat's been detected. What's unique about the Texas law is it has a very unconventional enforcement mechanism. It allows kind of private actors to enforce that law, uh, not mm -hmm. the government. That has made it kind of tough to overturn and difficult to strike down. Uh, litigation is still ongoing about it. Uh, a lot of the ongoing litigation has kind of dealt with procedural issues that, to be honest, I'm not really all that well versed in. Uh, but the two are separate cases. I mean, the Texas law is doing a lot of good right now. It is protecting, again, hundreds of preborn children every day. Uh, I think that that law will face additional legal challenges. I'm not as optimistic about that law as I am about the Mississippi law. Again, I think the Mississippi law really cuts at the important question can we protect preborn children? after a certain stage of gestation. And again, I think there's good reason for pro-lifers to be optimistic. Mm. Michael New, thank you so much for your years of work in this area, and we look forward to having you back after the, the uh, hearing that will take place. And then I guess there'll be a decision, what is that, at the end of June or so, Typically, most likely? the Supreme Court will issue these decisions toward the end of June. So okay. uh, we'll probably know something uh, around uh, June of 2022. Okay. Michael, thank you so very thank much. You. God bless you, brother. Thanks a lot, Jim. Keep it up. Yes, so we all need to be mm -hmm. praying at this time, as maybe as never before, that this is an opportunity. We need to pray for every Supreme Court justice and, and just, just pray for God's enlightenment to be given them that uh, they would see that, of course, human life has to be protected under law. And it's not even necessarily a religious issue, although mm -hmm. it's religious for sure. I mean, it's, it's a human rights, a civil rights issue issue and that hopefully Roe versus Wade will be overturned. If not, as Michael was saying, it's incremental. So if we can protect 15 weeks and maybe there'll be other reasons in that decision where you can even protect, you know, before then yes. and it would be upheld. We know the difference it's made in Birmingham yes. is that we had 24, you know, 24, 24 weeks, weeks abortion and then we've lowered it to 17 and it hasn't been contested and lives are indeed being saved. And we, have, we went from a 24-hour waiting period to a 48-hour wait that you have mm -hmm. to see an ultrasound. So hopefully this decision will overturn Roe, which just brings it back to the states for them to do what they believe that they should do. But many, many states will preserve life. Well, on the phone right now, we have Eric Scheidler. He is the executive director of Pro-Life Action Leave. There's a great website you can go to, overturnrow.org. Eric, we want to welcome you to At Home, and we want you to tell our EWTN family, what can we do, right? We're not on the Supreme Court, but what can we do as a people of God to participate while they are begin to hear this, court, the, this case on December 1st? Well, Jim and Joy, it's fantastic to be with you guys again. And I, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to share what people really can do in their own communities to make a difference. 
you know, this is a, a day that my father, Joe Scheider, who passed away back in January, didn't live to see. He fought for years for this day when the Supreme Court might really be ready to overturn Roe versus Wade. Um, and, and so I, I think the fact that the rest of us are here for this day is a real signal to us that we need to take part. Mm. This should not be just a moment for those who are, you know, court watchers or her attorneys, people who are kind of on the inside in Washington, D.C. This is a moment for the entire pro-life movement. This is something we should all take ownership of and all be involved with. And at overturnroad.org, we're offering opportunities for people to get involved. Now, number one, of course, is prayer. The first line of attack here is prayer for the Supreme Court justices, for the clerks, for Attorney General Fitch for the state of Mississippi, who's defending this law, who's asking the Supreme Court to uphold that law and go even farther and overturn Roe v. Wade. If you go to overturnroe.org, scroll down, you'll find a little prayer button. We will assign you a Supreme Court justice. Now, we're only 48 hours away, less than 48 hours away from the hearing. And so it's really critical that we really, really storm heaven with those prayers right now. Go to overturnroe.org, click on the pray button, You'll be assigned a justice. It might be Justice Sotomayor. It might be Justice Barrett. One of those nine justices will be yours to pray for, not just for the next 48 hours, but on through until June. As Dr. New said, that's when we're going to be getting the ruling. That's in June. We want to keep those prayers going. Yes. Secondly, you can participate in a local prayer rally. We have over 100 of these scheduled all over the country. There's likely to be one nearby. Anyone listening to this show right now, click on the Find a Rally button. You'll be able to find a rally near you where you can go and be with other pro-lifers. This is very important for us to be together mm-hmm. at this moment, at this historical moment, so that we can pray together, we can rally together, we can encourage each other. We've shipped out thousands of protest signs that say, Stop Abortion Now, Supreme Court Overturn Roe. We've got an amazing new flyer, Roe v. Wade, What's at Stake. We're passing out tens of thousands of copies of that flyer all over the country. You can get those flyers to pass out in your community to be part of educating our fellow Americans, because it's really on us. The mainstream media is not going to tell the truth about this. Mm -hmm. Not everybody's going to listen to a program like this where they hear about the truth. Mm -hmm. We need to go out and share the truth with our friends and neighbors about what's at stake with Roe v. Wade. People don't know that Roe v. Wade allows so much more abortion than they realize. They don't know. Even though they stand surveys, they support Roe, they don't know that that means they're supporting abortion for sex selection. They're mm-hmm. supporting abortion to, dis- to do abort disabled babies. They don't know they're supporting abortion very late into pregnancy. They don't know they're supporting abortion for birth control. All these things that people tend to oppose, they just don't know. We have to educate them. They don't know how Roe v. Wade has made our politics toxic and kept us from solving major problems like infrastructure and immigration because abortion always gets in the way because it's so federalized. We have to be responsible for educating the people. So education, prayer, and rallying, these are the op- opportunities that we're offering people at overturnroe.org. And I'm so excited for this moment when the whole pro-life movement can come together yes. from coast to coast and be a part of this effort to really make a radical change in abortion in our country and have the opportunity to save tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of unborn babies every year if we can get a great ruling from the court. Eric Scheidler, thank you so very, very much. Everybody go to overturnroe.org. That's overturnroe.org. Be a part of the prayer campaign. Go to a prayer and vigil site. They have a a link for you there. I know we have one at our capital uh, in Alabama. And so participate. You know, the Word of God says, those who close their ears to the cry of the helpless, you yourself will cry out and you will not be heard. And so especially during the season of Advent, we need to be vigilant, we need to man our post, and we need to cry out for the least. So thank you so much, Eric. And we even had a beautiful, uh, one of the local schools here reach out to us, St. Rose Academy, where on December 1st, they're going to have a prayer vigil of adoration right at their chapel, where they're inviting people to come. You say, well, maybe I can't go to Washington, or I can't go here, or I can't go there. You can go to your local parish for adoration. You are more than welcome to go to St. Rose Academy and sign up for their adoration in their chapel so that you can be a part of this. It's like everybody is a part of this. This is our moment in time. It has never looked like this before. Yeah. Ever. Sister Mary Juliana Cox at uh, St. Rose. Rose and I think it's tomorrow. It's mm-hmm. not on the day of it. But this is an inspiration. If they can do that, our churches should be open for adoration. 
during this, this time, the day before the day up to be praying for an overturn of this law that allows abortion through all nine months and at least hand it back to the states. It should be banished totally. Uh, but to hand it back to the states so that we can fight it out state by state and you'll see that life will prevail. We'll be right back. Plenty more to come. Be filled with hope. Mm. Don't go away. Of today's show, we're going to go to Rome to check in with beautiful Joan Lewis. Now, Joan, what are your thoughts on today's topic? Well, greetings, Jim and Joy, and here we are already again in Advent, that season in which we anxiously and joyfully await the birth of our Savior, Jesus. And Jesus, the Son of God, but he took on our human nature, including spending nine months in his mother's womb and arriving in the world as a helpless little infant, just like all of us were. And I think all of us can look back and think of a, a sister, a cousin, a granddaughter, some relative, or maybe even a best friend who was expecting a baby. And we all waited with joy for that birth. But you know what? The smiles on our faces kind of disappear when we think about the millions of tiny human beings, human beings who are not wanted who never see the light of day or feel a parent's hug or hear their mother sing a lullaby because they've been aborted. They've been killed by horrible means. And the worst part is that the killing, not the life of the baby, is protected by law. Now, over the years, of course, popes have made countless statements, pro-life statements about the sanctity of life, but so far not a syllable of those statements has ever penetrated governments and laws to protect the unborn. So I think we all can remember statements made by Popes John Paul and Benedict XVI, but perhaps no pope ever made as many striking pro-life statements as Pope Francis for the sheer audacity of his choice of words and often, of course, unscripted statements. Now, for example, in one general audience, he compared abortion to hiring a hitman. Another time he said, aborting children who are sick or disabled is like Nazi eugenics, but with white gloves. In fact, just this past September, in an in-flight press conference, the Pope stated very clearly, abortion is more than just an issue. Abortion is murder. Scientifically, it's a human life. The textbooks teach us that. But is it right to take it out just to solve a problem? And this is why the church is so strict on this issue, because accepting this is kind of like accepting murder on a daily basis. So will any statements such as these be in the minds of Supreme Court justices as they prepare Wednesday, December 1st, to hear arguments in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization? Because this is all seen, uh, seen by many as an all or nothing case for protecting the unborn. So oh, time's up here, unfortunately, but back to you. Joan, thank you so much for that sharing. Very powerful. And one particular line Joan said, killing not the baby is protected by law. Mm -hmm. So we live in a country where killing babies is protected by law. The baby's lives are not protected by law. I don't want to live in a country like that. Mm. And so we want to pray, we want to repent, we want to pray, especially for those Supreme Court justices, those that are making the appeal, that we could repent as a nation, and that this would be a huge step in that direction to reject Roe versus Wade, Doe versus, Doe versus Bolton, abortion through all nine months. And so that all together, we can begin to rebuild a new culture of life and marriage and the family, welcoming every human life mm -hmm. into this world, protecting every human life beginning at the moment of conception into life. So let us pray and let us work for life. You're an important part of this EW10 family. You're never alone. We're all in this fight for life together and life, marriage and the family will prevail. Keep it on EWTN. Bye now.